بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم today's topic is very obvious on the screen perioperative acute kidney injury a common and a serious problem which is often underestimated and undertreated so i will be discussing this topic under these following headings first of all the introduction applied renal physiology which is relevant to the topic understanding the term and definition of acute kidney injury acute kidney injury risk identification acute kidney injury risk reduction the markers the new thing in nephrology and lastly the take home message well i'm not here to read the morning news this is uh, a tuesday the russian president taking a dip in the siberian lake uh, during hot summer it is the same gentleman during freezing winters of russia okay so the message from this slide is the external environment has fundamental influence on the mood and behavior of the user so is the internal environment on the structural and functional integrity of the cell which is the basic unit of life and what constitutes the internal environment well it is the body fluid and what is body fluid it is water and electrolytes so optimal volume optimum composition and optimum ph of the body fluid will will provide a optimum environment to the cell uh one to function at its best so any change in the volume any change in the composition any change in the ph of the body fluid will alter the internal environment of the cell and thereby affecting the structural and functional integrity of the cell which in turn affects the health of the individual so this is an, just an example to show you what a change in composition of the extracellular fluid can do to the red blood cell thanks to the body's master chemist the key beans which helps to maintain optimal pH optimal volume optimal pH and optimal composition they were ensure an optimal health of the immune system so apart from maintaining volume composition and pH of the body fluid kidneys are also involved in the regulation of blood pressure sorry in the regulation of blood pressure production in the regulation of blood pressure and excretion of uh, waste products and excess water so any change in the volume so if you so if your kidneys are deranged or affected then you will change in the, the your, your patient will be fluid overloaded he may have electrolyte imbalance he may have pH imbalance may be acidotic he may be anemic he may be hypertensive he may have urinary symptoms he may he may have he may be susceptible to infection coagulopathy and all the common panics and complications of medication etc now this is to give you a sense of uh, uh, renal blood flow <coughs> renal blood flow is heterogeneous meaning the renal blood flow is not equally distributed to all the regions of the uh, renal parenchyma for example the metabolically active cortex sorry less metabolically active cortex receives only 90% of the blood this is 90% of the total renal blood flow whereas the medulla which is most metabolically active part of the nephron receives only 10% of the total renal blood flow not fair in contrast the oxygen extraction in the cortex is only 18% of the total oxygen delivered whereas the oxygen extraction in the medulla is 80% of the total oxygen delivered so the implications are is the medulla is extraordinarily sensitive to ischemia at times of stress hypertension hypoperfusion now coming to renal auto regulation when we look at this this is the nervous situated in the two or less than the axis upper end and the anterior the upper end arterial gets back to the blood vessels and the upper end arterial takes back away from the blood vessels so the first flow at first flow we may think 
the changes in systemic blood pressure will bring about change in the phenomena of blood flow and GFR. In fact, it does not happen so. Because there are sphincters in the afferent and different sphincters of arteries which act appropriately either constricting or dilating, and either constriction or dilatation depending on the system of pressure changes. For example, in, if the patient is hypertensive, if the blood pressure increases, there is afferent arterial constriction, so as to keep the domain of blood flow and GFR constant. In the event of hypotension, there is afferent arterial dilatation and different arterial constriction again to maintain the bound of blood flow and GFR in a steady state. So this increasing property of the kidney to maintain uh, uh, a steady bound of blood flow and GFR over a wide range of perfusion pressure is referred to as a in an optimization. This is this slide shows you, you know, the normal arena of ventilation curve, which is in yellow color. And uh, the purple one shows you the renal arterial regulation curve in a hypertensive patient. It is shifted to the right. So in normal tensive patients, the renal blood flow and the GFR is maintained in a steady state between 50 to 150 millimeters of mercury. Whereas in hypertensive patients or in elderly patients who have arterial sclerosis, the curve is shifted to the right and there is a steady state of renal blood flow GFR between 80 to 180 millimeters of mercury. So, it makes physiological sense to maintain a mean arterial pressure between 70 to 60 to 70 millimeters of mercury in a normal tensile patient and higher in a hypertensive patient uh, in doing our clinical practice. Now, what is free renal versus renal syndrome? But you have seen during hypertension, there is afferent arterial dilatation and different arterial constriction so as to maintain renal blood flow, uh, flow and GFR. Well, as hypertension continues, this doesn't happen. It, the the GFR starts forming. And look here, the same different arterial will contain a steady tubular capillaries. So there is always a risk of tubular hypoperfusion and tubular ischemia. So this state of hypertension or hypoperfusion following GFR. Yeah. But intact tubular cells, the, the tubular cells are still intact, okay, uh, is uh, referred to as free renal state. So the tubular cells are intact, so we have to absorb sodium and water to the maximum to keep the extra cellular volume. But if, but if you do not act, if you do not undertake any corrective measures, then the hypoperfusion continues and the tubular cell injury occurs. Okay, so this state of uh, hypoperfusion following GFR and uh, uh, in, uh, in ischemic uh, injured tubular cells is renal state. So now, what brings about different arterial dilatation, which is the prostaglandin? Okay, so if you, if you include non-steroglandin chronic drugs in your regime, then these non steroidal antiphobic drugs will block this phosphoglandin synthesis and thereby prevent this uh, defense uh, mechanism and pushing the patient to renal injury early. And what brings about different arterial constriction? It's predominantly angiotensin apart from norepinephrine uh, and AUD, that is also in basic So if, if the patient is on is inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, then the, uh, then again it will block the, this defense mechanism and can push the patient to bring an injury faster. Right. Now this slide sums you up, sums up the differences between the pre renal and renal state. As I said, in the pre renal is tubular functions intact, in renal tubular functions are impaired. The causes are hypovolemia, sepsis, and congestive cardiac failure. Congestive cardiac failure is effective and there is decreased effective circulation, renal circulation. Okay? For renal, it is color, contrast, and chemo. Okay? Apart from these causes, the color is mild or has seen in uh, fibromyalysis. Contrast, radiographic contrast, which can cause uh, in, uh, toxicity, and chemotherapy agents, including antibiotics. Amenable precise penicillins, chloroquinolones, cephalosporin, etc. Now, how do we differentiate pre renal 
from Greenland, from Latkes. Okay, and uh, for the sake of time, I will not, I will not explain much. Okay. So, just I want to tell you because there is intense absorption of sodium in water, the, uh, the uh, you know the filtered sodium which is excreted in urine is only one percent, less than one percent. And since the urine is concentrated, the osmolality is more than two hundred milli of moles. Whereas here it is less uh, concentrated, so less osmolality. Now, I think it, it's worthwhile to spend some time, you know, to uh, see the mechanism of action of <coughs> grass, which we use in our clinical practice. Okay. Now, if you look here, we have seen what the uh, natural anti-inflammatory drugs and ACE inhibitors and uh, angiotensin receptor blockers can do. Okay. Now, if you look at this, this is the red arrow. Red arrow represents filtration. And think it filters 200 liters of fluid per day. And the green arrow represents the reabsorption, which reabsorbs 198 liters of this fluid. So that means 198 liters of fluid is reabsorbed back into the circulation. So only 2 and 2 liters, 2 liters ends up in your way. So that is only 1% of the total filtrate ends up in your Such is the uh, reabsorbing capacity of the kidney. Okay, and this reabsorbing capacity is an oxygen consuming process. Okay, so if we inhibit reabsorption at any side, then we are likely to fill the bag if we are interested. Okay, so that's exactly what we can do in the green diuretic. So, the, so for us anesthesiologists, diuretic we usually mean blue diuretics. So, the blue diuretics are here. So, one more thing if you look here, this part of the nephron is in the cortex. And this part is the medulla, which, is, which receives the least blood flow. Okay, so any amount of reabsorption is not a problem here because there is good oxygen supply here. But if this loop is taxed with more osmones, osmotic load, then there is a problem. So the diuretic will prevent reabsorption here, here, and thereby increasing the urine output. Okay, so. If the, uh, the diuretics, you know, they prevent reabsorption. So that means they decrease the oxygen requirement of these cells. So we may think that the diuretics are you know, protective. Well, we will see later about it. And dopamine also does the same thing. Dopamine will decrease the reabsorption of the proximal tissue and hence increase the urine output. However, by decreasing the absorption here, dopamine will present osmotic load to this part of the nephron, which is resupplied by the blood. So there is a theoretical risk of dopamine causing injury to this part of the nephron. Again, we will see more of it later. Well, even dopamine is also known to increase renal blood flow. So that that doesn't mean that uh, this extra uh, blood flow is matching the uh, you know like extra osmotic load presented here actually it doesn't match and about the contrast and our patients may have the sweet contrast before or maybe after they may receive contrast during the drop into period so the contrast they act with osmotic load osmotic load here is not a problem the extra osmotic load is a problem here so again the contrast can cause injury to the tubular cell you know, by increasing the uh, oxygen requirement. So that's why it's advised, uh, you know, to use uh, uh, hypoosmolar or low os uh, isoosmolar contrast, and the volume of the contrast should be restricted to a small volume, just sufficient uh, for the successful examination. Well, now we have come to a topic. What is the uh, first of all? What is the term acute kidney injury? Well, acute kidney, you know, before 2004, kidney disease was given many names renal failure, renal shutdown, renal insufficiency, etc. But the term acute kidney, kidney injury is a consensus term for kidney disease. Now, the question is is acute kidney injury is synonymous with acute renal failure? No. Acute kidney injury is not synonymous with acute renal failure. Then what is the term acute kidney injury? What does it represent? Well, acute kidney injury represents 
a spectrum of kidney disease which extends from less severe. It extends from less severe injury to the most severe form that is renal failure. So the term renal failure should be best used for patients who have lost kidney function to the point uh, where life cannot be sustained without interventions. Now what is the definition of the acute kidney injury? Well, before 2004, there are more than 35 definitions in the literature. So this lack of consensus definition has been a major factor in hampering or uh, interfering <coughs> with clinical research and comparison of clinical data. Okay? And, and so, so the result is very little progress has been made in nephrology in terms of prediction, detection and treatment of uh, acute kidney injury. Okay, and this is evident when you compare the progress made in cardiology uh, you know, in terms of prevention, detection and treatment of acute coronary syndrome. Okay, and this is evident from this slide. So there is, you know, the biomarker field in myocardial injury has seen a profound change in the last 60 years. Okay, the cardiologists have moved from using aspartic amino transferase to the present use of proponins, ischemia, molecular albumin, etc. You know, in, in, the, uh, in detection, prevention of uh, uh, coronary syndrome. So the result is multiple modalities of uh, treatment and increased survival of the cardiac injury. Now let's see the progress in approach. It's creatinine all the way. For your information, creatinine has been used since 1917 for detection of kidney injury. So that means we have been using for the last hundred years without any, uh, you know, without any question. So the, the result was the lack of consensus definition. Okay. So what is the result of this? Only supportive care and high mortality. Now coming to the definition of acute kidney injury. Thanks to this FT group, acute dialysis formally initiated work. Well, before that, I want to say in the previous slide, you know, with due respect to my nephrologists, you know, the uh, you know the nephrologists have got a long way to go before they catch up to the cardiologists. Okay. So the, uh, the acute dialysis quality initiative group was formed in 2004, 2004 by a network of international experts in nephrology and intensive care uh, uh, to give uh, you know to give a consensus definition and they gave a graded definition based on serum therapy, urine output and GFR. In 2007, acute kidney injury network group it, def uh, it modified the FT groups FT's definition FT's definition um, and gave and gave definition based on serum caffeine and urine output and it eliminated GFR. Okay? And more recently, KD go group, that is kidney disease improving global outcomes. This group, it you know it modified these two definitions. In fact, it integrated these two definitions and gave a compromise or balanced or harmonized definition, again based on serum caffeine and urine output. So what is common in all these three? It is and now coming to acute dialysis quality initiative group definition. Okay, they gave a graded definition famously called the rifle criteria. You know the first three letters of right, you know the rifle, they indicate the severity of the infection. So as you go down, the severity, the, the severity increases. So morbidity and mortality increases, and more chances of chronic renal dysfunction and stage renal disease. Okay. The last two letters, L and E, represents outcome. Okay. The loss of function. So it is in the, if there is persistent loss of function for more than four weeks, it's classified as loss of function. And if the patient is dialysis dependent for more than three months. It's end stage renal disease. Now, the right one, the, the right one definition, it defined uh, acute kidney injury based on serum theatinine, urine output, and GFR. So, kidney is set to be at risk if the, if 
the serum creatinine increased by more than 1.5 times the baseline or urine output less than 0.5 mg per kg per hour for 6 hours or decrease in GFR to more than 25%. Okay. What is the time frame for the change in creatinine, serum creatinine? Well, it is 7, hour, it is seven, seven days or less. Now, coming to Atkins definition, as I said, Atkins modified the uh, Rifle's definition. Let us go back to Rifle's definition and see what modification Atkins did, Atkins group did. They eliminated the GFR criteria from it and they discarded this last two letters, this outcome criteria of Rifle. Okay, and they instead of this graded definition, they gave stage definition, stage one, stage two, stage three. Apart from that, they did some more modification. You will see in this slide. This is the skeleton of uh, Atkins uh, uh, definition. It resembles uh, the Atkins group uh, definition, the rifle definition, except the absence of GFR criteria and loss of function criteria here. Apart from that. Uh, I can add it to these two criteria. So I can group this group recognize that a small change in serum creatinine can bring about a significant change in morbidity and mortality. So they included that even 0.3 mg per deciliter increase in serum creatinine can bring about is is enough to save to keep the injury. Not necessarily don't have to wait for the creatinine to go to more than 1.5 percent. And the time frame given by them is 48 hours. Because we are talking about acute kidney injury, so it has to be 48 hours, not 7 days, which was defined in right to technica. Okay. And they also included all patients on dialysis, irrespective of their serum creatinine and urine output in the failure category, that is stage 3. Okay. So they removed the graded definition, that is uh, RAF, they, in this, uh, they included the stage category. And they also gave a uh, the definition of acute kidney injury in statement. This reflects this first criteria. An abrupt, the acute kidney injury may be defined as an abrupt, that is within 48 hours of absolute increase in serum creatinine concentration of more than or equal to 0.3 mm -hmm. mg per deciliter from baseline, and a percentage increase in serum creatinine concentration of more than 50%, or auriculia of less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for more than 6 hours. The KDGO definition, well, they didn't do much, they only integrated uh, the right rule and Atkins definition. So they included the 48 hours time frame of uh, Atkins group and 7 days time frame of uh, right rule group to satisfy both of both the groups and the urine criteria remains the same. Now, is kidney injury, acute kidney injury relevant? What's the big deal about acute kidney injury? Well, it's a common and a serious problem, as I said, and it's associated with significant morbidity and mortality. With incidence of incidence in hospital patients of 5 to 7 percent. And 5 percent of the patients who undergo dental surgery will have a kidney injury. And of these, 50 percent of these patients will recover, and the rest will progress with residual renal dysfunction. Staggering to the 30 percent of the cardiac surgery. You know, actually, the, the incidence range from 15 to 45 percent. I've taken the average of it 30 percent. Probably it reflects the nature of surgery and the uh, suboptimal baseline, uh, suboptimal baseline cardiac function and renal function. High morbidity, more complicated hospital costs. So, be because of wound infection, delayed wound healing, prolonged mechanical ventilation, dialysis, dialysis dependence, etc. So, hence, High economic burden on the health basis. Mortality, wide range, 10 to 80 percent. 10 percent in uncomplicated acute kidney injury, 50 percent in acute kidney injury complicated by multi organ dysfunction, and 80 percent in, uh, in acute injury which requires dialysis. <coughs> now, who is at risk of acute kidney injury? Well, so as we have seen, there is significant increase in morbidity and mortality in acute kidney injury. So it's logical uh, uh, to, to improve the outcome, we have to identify the patients at risk before, so as to minimize the risk. Okay? The risk factors associated with development of acute kidney injury 
uh, may be classified into patient dependent factors and uh, surgical related factors or procedural related factors. Now, coming to patient related factors age, older and sicker the patient, greater the chances of acute kidney injury, irrespective of uh, you know, the clinical setting. Obese patient, they have a unique morbidity profile. These patients may be hypertensive, diabetic, hyperlipidemic, or dyslipidemic, and arthritic. So they are more, most likely to be prescribed with uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs, ACE inhibitors, diuretics. And we have seen all these three are, uh, are not good for the kidney. The problem doesn't end here. Rhabdomyolysis is quite common in morbid obese patients because of sustained positioning. Uh, during surgery and any intraperitoneal procedure, whether it is open or uh, laparoscopic, puts this patient at risk of acute kidney injury. Hypertension, diabetes mellitus, well, for obvious reason of endocrine damage as a result of these diseases and changing the upper regulation curve and abolition of upper regulation uh, by diabetes in diabetic neuropathy. Cardiac disease, obvious reason. Suboptimal cardiac function and suboptimal renal circulation. Any vascular disease, whether it is peripheral, cerebrovascular disease, or coronary artery disease, all puts the patient at risk of acute kidney injury. Chronic kidney disease, because again, <coughs> why? Because there is abolition of artery regulation in this patient. So there can be acute and chronic injury in these patients. COPD patients, sepsis, again, loss of uh, artery regulation, and endotoxics. Ascites because of increased intra-abdominal pressure and compromised renal circulation. Now coming to the surgical factors, duration of surgery. Longer the duration of surgery, greater the risk of acute kidney injury. Intraperitoneal surgery, in, with, uh, especially long duration, with uh, which causes large fluid shifts, can pose problem of acute kidney injury. Vascular surgery. For obvious reason, for example, of uh, uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm, cross clamping of the aorta, uh, perioperative hypertension, bleeding, hemodynamic instability, uh, and ethereal involvement from the uh, aneurysm. Liver transplant, again, hemodynamic instability, bleeding, bed transfusion, and use of immunosuppressives. Cardiac surgery, but this is the setting, and that you know, the acute cardiac, acute kidney injury has been extensively studied in cardiac surgical setting. So, the causes are well enumerated uh, uh, in this uh, setting. First of all, the bypass circuit. So, bypass circuit, there is falling, uh, perfusion pressure, reduction of pulsatile, uh, pulsatile uh, uh, blood flow, and then uh, activation of inflammatory cascade because of the blood coming into contact with the foreign circuit, the foreign surface. Hemodilution. hemodilution, because hemodilution, yes, it is good in a way because it decreases viscosity and improves micro circulation, but too much is too bad. So, too much of hemodilution will put the patient at risk of acute kidney injury. So, it is advised to restrict hemodilution to uh, not less than 21 percent and hemoglobin of not less than 7 gram percent. Okay, and the type of surgery also. You know, a combined valve and uh, cabbage is puts the patient at more risk than cabbage alone. Use of intraarterial balloon pump uh, and uh, blood transfusion. Now, you know, where this surgery involves a lot of blood transfusion and which puts an oxidative stress in the kidney. Now, thanks to this acute kidney injury risk index, you know, this was. Uh, uh, prepared after evaluating 152,000 patients undergoing dental surgery. Okay, so they found they have taken nine risk factors, so they assigned one the score of one to each of these risk factors, and depending on the score, they classified into five classes: class one, zero to two risk factors, and class five, more than or equal to six risk factors. The so class one puts the patient at risk uh, of acute kidney injury at just 0.2 percent. Where the risk increases to 10 percent uh, when, uh, when the patient is in class 5. So, sorry. so, if you have a patient in your clinic who is elderly, male, hypertensive, diabetic, mild dementia, 
post abdominal surgery, uh, then he runs a risk of 10% for getting a few kidney injury. Now, what could be done to decrease the incidence of a two kidney injury? Right. There is no substitute to this. Careful and thoughtful preoperative assessment to identify the patient's at risk. Two, intraoperative hemodynamic optimization. Three, minimize exposure to nephrotoxins. And four, management of postoperative complications. <coughs> now, coming to intraoperative hemodynamic optimization. Well, there is no magic bullet to prevent acute injury. Okay. So, uh, you know, the only pro methods are sensible ones. First, maintenance of intravascular volume, taking care not to overload the patient because overloading will prevent, uh, will cause delayed wound healing, infections, prolonged mechanical ventilation, and hemodilution, etc. Maintenance of mean arterial pressure range with, uh, in the mean arterial pressure in the artery regulation, depending on the patient and procedure. By this, I mean, you know, um, a patient with uh, hypertensive, you should keep the mean arterial pressure in higher range. So you don't, for procedure, I mean, you don't need to do a hypertensive technique for a patient who is undergoing hernia repair surgery. The anticipation of hemodynamic disturbances, so as so that we are better prepared to handle or counter the uh, hemodynamic changes. Monitor urine output to more than 0.5 ml per kg per hour. Well, this figure is a consensus figure. There, are, there is no there are no randomized studies to confirm this. Okay, and careful glycemic control. Uh, you know, avoid large fluctuation in blood, you know, blood sugars, large fluctuations. Minimize exposure to nephrotoxins. Well, you know all of this now. Management of postoperative complication. A successful surgical outcome may not mean a successful renal outcome. So, watch out for these problems in the postoperative period. Cardiac dysfunction, hemorrhage, sepsis, rhabdomyolysis, and intraabdominal hypertension. You know, to prevent the development of postoperative acute kidney injury. Now, perioperative oliguria. The perioperative oliguria is quite common. And fortunately for us, it rarely implies acute kidney injury. It's only a sign of hypovolemia in surgical patients until otherwise proven. So that means it's a physiological response to hypovolemia. And here comes a shocker. Absence of oliguria does not exclude acute kidney injury. Okay. Technically, we have seen all the three definitions, rifle, actin, pedigo. They have taken urine output as a criteria and defining acute kidney injury. And they have defined oliguria as only if the urine output, uh, this urine output persists for more than six hours, then only it is oliguria. So now the question is, do we, suppose if you have a patient who is 80 kilograms and he has put out only 50 ml of urine in the last two and a half hours, will we do take this for granted? No, I don't think, no, none of us dare to take this for granted because we don't like to see this. We like to see this because this makes us feel better. So what do we do? We think of some medications to fill the lack because we are confident about our fluid replacement. Well, I think your first, I'm very sure your first impression was different from your, than your second impression about this picture. Okay, this is the illusion. We have the same illusion with dopamine and diuretic. So when we have, when we encounter oliguria, we give renal dose of the so-called renal dose of the This we have been doing this since 1960. Okay, so in fact we have been due by dopamine since 1960. So let's see. Well, now this full bag will make us feel good. Now the question is, does dopamine does any good to the kidney? Well, the answer is, you know, all the, the meta-analysis published in 2001 by Kellum clearly demonstrated that dopamine is of no use either in prevention or treatment of acute kidney injury. Okay. 
Now the question is, does, that, does this do any harm to the kidney? Well, we will see that in the next slide. Uh, this is, you, have, you know the site of action of dopamine, it prevents reabsorption here, and it presents osmotic load here. Okay, so this came the tubular injury here. But it's also said that dopamine increases renal blood flow. And as I said, this extra oxygen delivery is not, will not make up for that extra osmotic workflow present in the dopamine. So there is a theoretical risk of acute kidney injury in dopamine. But however, the good news is there are no studies to confirm this. So the message is if you want to give dopamine, you're welcome to do so. But take care, your patient is well hydrated before that. Otherwise, you will push the patient to pre renal state. Aliguria, the same thing can be said about uh, diuretics here. Yeah. So, diuretics act here, they prevent the absorption and they feel the back and they are happy. Okay, But the diuretics will push the patient to pre renal state very soon if you have not taken care of hydration and perfusion. So, do not use diuretics just to fill the bag. Okay? So uh, in fact the use of diuretics is limited to flush the kidney, you know, from debris in case of you know muscle trauma, um, etc. Now the current interest in the in the treatment uh, prevention and man, uh, uh, and you know the treatment of alleguria and prevention of uh, acute kidney injury is in the two drugs. Phenaldopan and they can be treated by bite. Okay, these two drugs are studied in cardiac, cardiac setting, not in not in uh, the surgical setting. The main problem is systemic hypertension. Okay, the only advantage this is phenaldopan is an analog of dopamine. The main advantage of this is it has no alpha and beta effect, so you can safely give in peripheral way with no risk of uh, ischemic injury to the leg. Okay, and no risk of arrhythmias. Myocardial ischemia, etc. But with dopamine, yes, there is this stuff, myocardial ischemia, arrhythmia, and uh, even dopamine is known to depress the respiratory drive, so it may prolong mechanical ventilation. That's not so with phenaldopan. Okay, anyway, uh, very small studies are there uh, which are given encouraging results about these two drugs. We need larger studies before we actually use them in our practice. Now, do we need something other than creatinine? to diagnose or predict kidney injury. Well, we look for the answer in the next slide. Well, the so-called serum creatinine begins to increase 36 to 48 hours after injury. So that means your patient has already shifted to renal state. Renal state, okay? So creatinine is a retrospective indicator. It's a retrospective indicator. It tells you that kidney injury has already occurred. So if creatinine were to increase here, or at least here, we could have taken measures to salvage or rescue the kidney. So by depending on creatinine, we will miss this window of opportunity, you know, to take measures to prevent acute kidney injury. So, sorry. So now, so we definitely need a biomarker other than creatinine which can help us in early prediction and diagnosis of acute kidney injury, identify the site of acute kidney injury, etiology of acute kidney injury, and monitor response to interventions and treatment, and also to predict the outcome. Now the question is, are there any biomarkers on the bench? Well, since 2004, there have been 34, more than 30 biomarkers defined. And the present focus is on these four biomarkers, one is statin C, neutrophil gelatinase associated lipocalin, this NGAL, kidney injury molecule 1, that is KIM1, and interleukin 18 in 18. Okay. However, at present, they remain experimental. We need larger validation uh, studies to, uh, you know, prior to the transition into clinical practice. However, it's most likely that we are likely to use these biomarkers for the next few years. So coming to the take home message, perioperative acute kidney injury is a common and a serious problem, increases surgical morbidity, mortality and increases hospital cost. The best way to manage perioperative uh, kidney injury is to prevent it. Okay? The only poor methods are sensible ones, that is identification of at-risk patients, 
maintenance of hydration, perfusion, infection control, careful glycemic control, and avoidance of nephrotoxic. So, an apparent successful surgical outcome may not mean a successful renal outcome. So, watch out for the post op complications okay, to manage them early so as to prevent development of acute injury. The routine administration of low dose dopamine, the so called renal dose of dopamine, to patients for prevention and treatment of acute kidney injury is no longer justified. Diuretics and low dose dopamine are no substitute for hydration. Biomarkers are the future to screen patients for acute kidney injury prior to an actual increase in serum creatinine. And last but not the least, remember kidneys are for life. So it's our responsibility to keep them fighting fit during the perioperative period. Thank you. Some more than happy if there are any questions.